Hello everyone, welcome today. Thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Scott Sugden. I am Product and Technology Outreach Manager here at L Acoustics. Uh, today we really have a, an exciting presentation about uh, system calibration, the workflow, and we're going to talk a bit about tuning as well. I've brought with me today an expert panel of moderators as well as a co-host uh, in this presentation. Francois, how are things with you in Massey today? All good, thank you. So hello everyone, so thank you for the invitation. So all good, quite excited for, by this uh, third, third webinar for me, so I hope you, you'll enjoy it. Excellent. Well, thank you for joining us, Francois. Francois is head of uh, education and training at L Acoustics and been with us a long time. Uh, for those of you who love the new auto solvers, Francois is a big part of making that happen over the last couple of years. So thank you, Francois, for all your work. Um, I'm going to stick by uh, and go from west to east today. So I think the closest person to me is Andre Pichette, our uh, Canadian who's migrated to Vegas. Andre, how are things in Las Vegas? Oh, Andre missed a pickup. Oh. So everything's well here. Uh, everything's closed, of course, like uh, mostly everywhere. So we start. We, we try to stay safe and healthy. Uh, I will answer a question in English, and uh, je vais aussi présent, répondre aux questions en français slash québécois pour uh, que ça soit plus compréhensible. Merci, Scott. Thank you, Scott. Thank, thank you, Andre. Josh, how are you doing in Michigan these days? Uh, doing well. A little, little bored. Uh, it's cold and we're stir crazy, but we're here. Excellent. Josh Mikeley is an uh, application engineer, specifically House of Worship. Uh, you may have seen him star in videos such as how to design your uh, House of Worship venue from a couple weeks ago. Once again, if you want to recheck any of those old videos out, you can do that on YouTube. Uh, heading a little bit further east today as well, Sergey in London. Sergey, thank you for joining us yet again. Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome again to another, just another webinar. And uh, there will be more to come, but this one is going to be an interesting one. Thank you very much, Sergey. Sergey will help uh, moderate some questions in the chat in English and Russian. If you're unaware, so please don't hesitate if it's easier for you to communicate in uh, native tongue. Uh, we've got that covered today in uh, French and English and uh, Quebecois and uh, Russian as well as German. Thank you, Martin. Martin, how are things today? Yeah, it's uh, very good in Germany. We're still all here in the area around Berlin. And um, I'm happy to answer questions in English and of course also also in German. So if when the Fragen von euch sind aus dem deutschen Chat auch gerne in Deutsch schreiben, ich beantworte die gerne. Great. Well, thank you guys. So today is about loudspeaker system calibration. Um, specifically, we're going to kind of think about the, the workflow from start to finish of the calibration itself and a bit more specifically on the tuning aspect of that. Um, so I want to think a little bit about calibration, and, and it's interesting. It's a, it's a good word. Francois, I think uh, you came up with uh, 350 different words for calibration that we've been using in this industry over the years. Is that correct, Francois? Yes, probably. Even internally, it was uh, quite difficult to agree on uh, on the actual uh, terminology that uh, that we would use for this. But we we end up with with many words. So when you think about calibration, you have all this this word that can uh, pop into your mind. And um, but yeah, we 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 need to speak the same language. Uh, we need to agree on the signification of all these terms, and that's why we decided uh, to focus on I would say the three main three main terms here, which are calibration, tuning, and frequency response. And um, even those. Only three uh, terms are not easy to, to agree uh, on. So, um, Jeff, I want to tease a bit. The uh, concept is that calibration is not only about tuning. So when we think about calibration, many people, they only think about the, the fact that you go on site and you tune a system. So calibration is much more than that. Um, then tuning itself is not only about on-site tuning. So uh, it's going to be... Uh, also uh, talk about what you can do in design and then we'll talk about uh, frequency response so frequency response again uh, is something which is uh, quite overlooked um, that's not the end of the story that's not uh, necessarily uh, also representing 
all what you can, uh, I would say, uh, uh, grab for, for from a, a system behavior. So we'll try to 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 go on uh, this different different concept. Um, let's uh, start with calibration uh, quickly. So what is calibration? So we came up with this definition, which is, I would say, quite uh, universal. This is when you have a, a device which is uh, designed for specific purposes. Uh, we're going to use it, implement it in, a, in specific uh, conditions, and we, we, we want that uh, what was planned in the design uh, is actually uh, reached in terms of performance by this uh, device on site. Um, so when we think about the loudspeaker system calibration, this is really really an optimization process. This is not really not a correction of major design issues. So I think Scott, you're going to repeat this uh, again and again. Uh, but this is really uh, something which is transversal and it need to be to be properly thought from the beginning. This is really the optimization of uh, a design solution. So something that was really planned from the design stage. Um, then yes, once on site, uh, you'll need to uh, to address uh, the on site condition, extra, extra. You need to uh, to to optimize it uh, according to to where it's implemented. Uh, but also, I would say, uh, and something which is uh, sometimes uh, overlooked, is that we what we are going to calibrate. This is a tool that is going to be used by someone. So we should never forget about the fact that we're going to calibrate a tool for the end users for specific purposes. Well, I think that's great, Francois. You're you're saying something that is a core to my belief. I think it's Elacoustic's belief. When we're on site and we're doing a calibration uh, of the system, we we can't fix the problem that was ultimately created many steps earlier, right? So this this whole process has to be correct from the beginning. And if you will, that's the the project workflow, right? So um, that's that idea of design first, right? So let's do a proper system design um, implementation through calibration and then finally to operation. It's that four part L acoustics workflow that we've been talking about for the last several weeks. Um, and the first part of that is the project workflow is the design itself, right? And in that design process, we can start to define the solution for our problem. You know, our problem is we want to have a certain amount of coverage in a given venue. Um, we want to uh, uh, look at a certain amount of uh, SPL or performance. I want to have a certain amount of consistency. Um, I'm looking for certain things like this alignment between these scenarios. All of that can actually be defined in a 3D model. And at that point, you can make adaptation of that design really quite easily without having to ask everyone to reinstall the loudspeakers in 11 new locations. So it's really the right time to try and to find the best solution for your given set of, of challenges. All right, second thing we get on site, we do the implementation. At this point, we install our sound system, right? So we're gonna we're gonna put speakers in the air. Um, we're gonna configure our network setup in LA Network Manager. We're gonna configure things like routing and patching of all of our cables. At this point, we also might start to discover a certain number of anomalies in our design. Uh, it turns out I can't actually achieve the position I wanted. Um, I can't come to the solution I wanted. Um, and, and if they're large enough, we might start to need to think about returning back to step one and just verifying that the choices we're making are still valid. Right, step three of the L acoustics workflow is all about calibration. And this is where we do, as Francois was saying, verification of the system, right? Is it working as we expect? We can do some on-site tuning. Um, and when we do certain things in tuning on-site, we can compensate for problems that are hard to deal with in a simulation environment. Um, and we might wanna go through and check to make sure that the model is correct. Hey, did did uh, the 3D model provided by the venue match our actual on-site? Um, are the rigging conditions where we expect them to be? All these different steps of the process. And then near the end of that calibration process is hand over to the end user. At the end of the day, um, we wanna make sure that the end user of our sound system, whether that's a mixing engineer, whether that's a venue producer or owner, is satisfied with the performance that they're getting in their system. And then of course we have operation of our sound system. And this is where we can do control, like modify the EQ a bit based on atmospheric conditions. We can monitor the response of the system with the RTA built into LA Network Manager 3.0 and above. Um, we can do some live adjustments. Uh, we can even monitor and watch the output levels of the system to make sure it's operating within safe parameters. 
So all of this is something we can deal with in operation mode of our L acoustics workflow. So let's talk a little bit about tuning, right? So Francois was trying to describe and did describe really clearly the difference between calibration and tuning. So what is tuning, right? Tuning is the electronic optimization of loudspeaker system performance. Um, Francois, I think you can help elaborate on this a bit, but this is not just uh, making sure it's it's operating within its norms, but it's also trying to hit a, a certain specification of, of the design. Is that correct? Oh, you're still muted there, Francois. Sorry, 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 I was muted. So, um, yeah, so what the definition of tuning, so, so as uh, Scott just said, um, so calibration is much more than tuning, but still tuning is is a, is one of the I would say the the, one, the core of it, and uh, we still need need to focus a bit on it. Uh, we won't elaborate too much about verification and handover today. So um, let's talk about tuning. So tuning is. Uh, still optimization, but now we are talking about electronic optimization. So we're going to be able to adjust uh, some things to, to the system through electronics. So um, uh, we won't be able to, to change some of the basic design uh, uh, results like uh, the coverage of the source or uh, SPL capability, mm -hmm. uh, depending on the system type you, you that has been chosen, extra, extra, but still we have way to, to improve uh, some things uh, and most of the time we are focused on the frequency response. All is about first uh, standardization. So what is standardization is we want to match uh, a reference with consistency. So what is this reference? Uh, first, this is this uh, reference frequency response what what we uh, how we want the system to behave and that's a way to uh, to characterize our system but now um, um, this uh, reference response is is established by a reference source and this reference source is going to be uh, mainly our main first <coughs> we're going to build our reference response uh, uh, also by aligning this main with a subwoofer. So this is really the combination of both that now is going to uh, to define our reference response and then uh, adding more element, more complement to the system. Uh, all are going to, to, to be implemented uh, with a wish to maintain this uh, reference uh, um, response established by our uh, reference source, which is covering most of the audience. So, <clears throat> talking about the audience and talking about consistency, we would like um, this reference to be uh, provided to uh, as much as possible to, 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 to the whole audience. We, we would like that everyone experience uh, the same show. But now, uh, all this is about uh, ideal standardization, but we need to still to, I would say, to, to, to fit uh, our system to the actual condition in which it's implemented. That's all about customization. <clears throat> so first, uh, the venue in which it's implemented. So we we know that different rooms are, are going to be behave differently and we may wish to adapt our fre frequency response uh, uh, differently depending on the venue. And also, uh, whether it's indoor, outdoor, the, the atmospheric condition are also a big part of the on-site condition to, to address, depending on uh, the time you design the system to the time you uh, finally implement it, or maybe uh, during a festival from the morning to the night, atmospheric conditions are, are going to change, and this is something you, you need to address. Now, um, not forgetting again the, the, f the final uh, purpose of, of this tool to, uh, to to be used by someone is that we we need to think about which kind of program is going to be a, a play on the system or what are the, the habits of the mixing engineer etc etc all of this make it quite complex that's a lot about uh, again compromises between uh, what we want uh, we want the FOH to be representative or the audience to be homogeneous, extra, extra. So there is this balance between standardization and customization, which is, uh, uh, I would say, behind this uh, tuning concept. Um, <clears throat> so at L Acoustics, we have a, a, a philosophy uh, about the tuning. Uh, again, um, I'm going to repeat myself, but this is not only about the on-site tuning. Uh, actually, all start at the factory, 
we won't go into details now, but you already have a, a quite a, a clean starting point with a, with a direct response, which is already optimized uh, with preset, uh, sub-ratio recommendation, etc., etc. So that you, you already start with something which is uh, quite nice, but then even before uh, optimizing the system on site, we can do a lot in design. Uh, using our simulation software, and I think uh, I think uh, Scott is going to uh, elaborate a bit more about that. But uh, we have the power of having a full 3D view of what's happening uh, in terms of frequency response on axis. We uh, we can have a frequency response every 20 centimeter. So there are some optimizations that you will never be able to achieve uh, on site through measurement. So you should use uh, at most as possible what is afforded by uh, your simulation software. Um, so we can uh, model up to the electronic settings in SunVision and then implement uh, all of it in, uh, in our control software in uh, LA Network Manager. Now we still need to do something on site. So now we have a complete suite of, of tools for this uh, with the P1 station and, uh, and the M1 tool in LA Network Manager. So uh, that's basically the, the tuning week, the M1 week for the webinar. So I'm not going to describe all of it, uh, but just for you to know that uh, uh, LA Acoustics has, a, I would say, a logical um, suite of tools that uh, is really fitting our philosophy in terms of tuning approach. Thank you, Francois. I think that's really important to remind everyone that um, what we can do with a, a tuning on site is really determined by what has existed in the design beforehand. Um, and as Francois iterated, we're going to go a little bit into sound vision today. We did a, a whole bunch of that uh, last week and the week before. If you would like to dig any deeper into sound vision, please don't hesitate to check out our YouTube channel. Uh, it'll be uh, uh, available for you guys uh, over the next coming weeks to, uh, to help improve your skills. Um, so please don't uh, hesitate to do that. So let's talk a little bit about frequency response. I just want to give a really simple overview and a few things to consider, and that'll really be some background for us to talk more about um, for the next half hour or so. So when we talk about frequency response, specifically like magnitude, that's a, a transfer function of the, the, the listener versus the source. Um, and of course, the response is, is both uh, the magnitude and the phase. And, and the way we can think of this is if I'm sending this signal in blue uh, from my mixing board and it goes through my sound system, but what I hear on the other end looks something like this, then what we know is that the, the change in that response is that measurement of frequency response is a, a lovely sawtooth picture on the bottom, right? So um, what we're trying to do is figure out what that frequency response is, and then we can start to think about some objectives. Now, often uh, I hear the term flat. I want a flat sound system. Um, flat is a, a reasonable thought process and a word, but I actually like the word, and I think Francois, you like this one as well, neutral a lot better, right? A neutral sound system or a neutral transfer function, which means it doesn't tonally change the, the response of the system. Is that, that's your preference as well, correct? Yeah, yeah. Yep, and so what do we, I'll go ahead, Francois. No, no, maybe you're going to talk about this, but uh, you're going to go to this point that um, many people, they forget that we are not listening to a frequency response. Exactly, right? Like at the end of the day, and I know this from my years of experience, that what people are listening to is not the, the response that I see on my measurement system or my RTA, but they're they're actually uh, mixing to what they want it to sound like, right? And, and we know this. If uh, if a sound system has uh, more low end than they desire, they tend to move the high pass up on every channel strip or, or, or change the EQ and the low end on everything because they're targeting something in their, their process, right? There's something that they're targeting and that's ultimately what we hear is what the target of the mixer is. Um, so we can think of the response as neutral, doesn't change the tonal response in linear. And, and the goal of a linear system is that of every manufacturer, that it gets equally louder, right? So it doesn't doesn't go nonlinear. In other words, the, the low end doesn't get louder at a quicker rate than the high end as the system turns up and down in level. And we don't want that to happen. So we can also think of a system having an LF contour. And this system is not neutral, it's non neutral, right? So it's, it's changing the tonal response, but it's still linear. So um, we're adding or imparting a tonal shift in the response of the system. 
um, but we're doing that in a way that it gets louder and quieter equally as the system goes up and down. And we're still achieving that ultimate same output scenario that's been desired for a live show. Right, so the amount of low frequency content in a sound system for a live show is much different than the amount of low frequency content you might have in your headphones uh, that you listen to or your your uh, sound speaker system at your desk. Right, so the, those are a very different feeling from what we perceive as as adequate or acceptable in a live show for 10,000 people than what we experience in a studio environment or a set of headphones. Um, it's interesting. Uh, I always think of this as what came first, the the spectrum or the response. Um, I think part of this goes back in time to when we had less headroom in our mixing consoles, and if we were to impart all that low end on the channel strip, it would be a real problem for higher and higher frequencies that have less dynamic range uh, and a higher noise floor. So this is a really important aspect of the way systems are tuned, and almost every sound system in the world is tuned with a low frequency contour, either imparted directly into the main system itself or also in a combination with the subwoofer system. So let's talk a bit about maybe our reference target. Um, there's a couple of things, just real basic concepts here. We might want to think about the smoothness of the response, um, and we can describe that as, as how smooth it is. And, and I look for, for instance, in this top graph, I see some ripples, and I see that red line is, is quite challenged in terms of its smoothness. It has a lot of variation. So we might describe the problems in our measurement and the problems of our frequency response in terms of smoothness. The second thing we might think about describing is in that bottom graph is the size of the low frequency contour. We measure that usually in dB um, and its pivot frequency. So for instance, I prefer the pivot frequency somewhere closer to 500 Hertz. Uh, some people might prefer it somewhere closer to 800 Hertz and some might like it closer to 300 Hertz. So we might describe where we want that pivot from the, the, the flat response in the high end to the increase in low frequency energy in the low end. And then that amount of energy, how many dB bigger is the low end than our plateau in the mid and high? So those are ways to describe this we might use. So the system response itself, right? What kind of things affect the system response? Um, you know, from the mixing board to the output of the ears? Well, of course, uh, the choices that L-Acoustics makes in the loudspeaker processing affect that. So these are the crossovers we choose, the electronic optimizations we choose in the amplification and DSP. It turns out cable has an effect as well, right? If you run really, really long cables, that can have an attenuation effect in the very high frequency um, that can be perceivable, measured, and noticeable to the listener. The choice of your uh, 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 design of the loudspeaker itself and also of the line source itself, right? So. Um, we can think of changing the angles in a line source ray will have an effect on how it sounds to people. And of course, last and definitely not least, it turns out the sound has to travel from the speakers to your ears, and it does that through the atmosphere. Um, so depending on where you live in the world, you are more or less used to this being a big problem. Here in Los Angeles, it's a significant issue because we have very dramatic swings from, from daytime to nighttime in terms of humidity and temperature. It's a little bit different for Sergey in London, who has never seen a sunny day above uh, 30 degrees Celsius ever. Um, uh, I think that's about right. Um, and uh, generally, the word down the street is if you're going to do a festival, it's supposed to rain every day. I think that's how it works in London. The other thing too is the system response is not just that of a single speaker, but we also have to think about how the contributions of other elements within the system affect the response. So of course, as we started out saying, this is the combination of the main plus the subwoofer. The two of those, as you start adding elements, become the new system response, right? We started with just the measurement to the main, now we've added the measurement of the sub. That is now the response that my user is experiencing because I've used the sub in my system. And this continues to grow and grow as we add fills, as we add uh, delays, as we add all these other components to our system that are gonna change that response for more and more of our users. Of course, though, what you're hearing is the system, um, but we don't just hear the system, we hear the room as, as well, right? So we have to start to think about how the direct sound versus the reflected sounds combine. Um, and we need to start thinking about what actions we can take as sound engineers, as systems engineers, as mixing engineers, and what actions are challenging to take. So 
So I think uh, just to, to, to summarize this up a little bit, uh, a few things can come together on this, right? Many factors for potential deviation, um, either from the reference response or from uh, spatial homogeneity or consistency, right? Um, uh, you know, if we're talking about optimization, we're talking about uh, using equalization or alignment, right? So when we put our main source subs together, there's a couple things that will affect that. Um, it's going to be affected by the choice we make in time or polarity alignment, um, i.e. the phase, or there could be a, a, a optimizations happening from the equalization as well. And this is based on data from either simulation or measurement. So we're going to actually get a certain amount of our data from the simulation environment, and that's because we can simulate, as Francois said earlier, a lot more information than we can necessarily measure on site. Francois, this is one of your favorite slides, I think. Um, it turns out yeah. uh, we, we often look at graphs, but that's not what we hear, right? No, exactly. So uh, actually, there, there is quite a, a powerful uh, listening demonstration in, in our training. So, But that's the main takeaway that, that, that we can get from this is that, uh, yeah, we, some people, they like to see uh, tuning as a as a game, so they are focused on uh, on the screen, on on this magnitude frequency response that that we can see on the screen. But actually, that's not necessarily uh, representative of uh, of what we we are hearing. So um, that's not that easy to demonstrate here. But uh, as soon, what we we should understand is as soon as comb filtering is involved, so can be uh, uh, from a, a complementary system because uh, the, the two sources are, are separated in space, so there is a difference in 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 time arrival, uh, bringing comb filtering. But that's the same for reflections. So reflections are kind of replica of, of the of the main uh, signal, but delayed uh, in time, bringing again this comb filtering effect. Uh, so we should understand that uh, this uh, deviation in the magnitude response that are actually created by comb filtering uh, behind this magnitude problem, actually this is not something that we can solve only with a, I would say, a magnitude uh, weapon as, a, as an EQ, uh, because uh, behind this uh, there is a time uh, dimension and there is probably a, a special dimension. So um, that's not that obvious that uh, we can hear the same thing by looking at the same frequency response. It depends uh, what's behind and that's why critical listening is always something that we should rely on and we should never forget to uh, to listen, listen and listen. Um, <laughs> and that's by the way, that's different uh, depending on, uh, on the frequency range. So but all of this is much more uh, uh, there are much more to elaborate uh, on this, but that's basically uh, still something which is really, really, really important to understand. So I, I like to start out and in, in kind of, let's say, define the challenges of uh, measurement. So um, when we're on site taking measurements, what information is really helpful to us and, and what is maybe less helpful to us? Um, and this comes from two aspects, right? This comes from uh, uh, knowing what is uh, response that's consistent across the venue, and this is also understanding what has a lot of variability in measurement. So um, the first thing that's really important to understand is the effect of atmospheric radiance on measurements, especially at distance, right? Um, so the further you get away from a sound system, especially when you're outside and there's a bit of air movement, um, you actually see a pretty significant uh, deviation from one measurement to the next. So um, this is actually a graph of a set of measurements we took uh, a year and a half ago, I want to say, Francois, that sounds about right, maybe two years ago? No, it's, it was uh, about one year, one year ago. No, oh, there you go, one year ago. Yeah. So this is a festival uh, just outside of Paris, um, and this is actually at 85 meters away from the main system of K1, K2. So it's uh, quite well within its traditional coverage distance. This wouldn't be an unexpected amount of throw for a system of its size. Um, and so we actually took 200 individual measurements with effectively very little or no wind. So it was a, a really calm day at the end of the, uh, at, at 200 meters or pardon me, 85 meters away. And what we see is a huge variation from one measurement, one time to just a few seconds later the next time. So this was 200 individual measurements over the course of, of less than an hour. Um, and, and it's really interesting to see the variation we see from one measurement to the next. So this starts to become 
a problem because uh, if you were to take a, a couple of measurements and average them together, if you were to, to just take one measurement and, and say, hey, I see a, a bit of a ripple at six or seven or eight kilohertz, the question is how significant is that ripple? Is it within the confidence or within the, the known condition? So this starts to show me that at 85 meters away, outside in very gentle atmospheric conditions, um, it's pretty hard to take a measurement of a sound system and know that that's actually going to be the actual behavior of the system at that point. So uh, we want to start thinking about simulation at that kind of a distance for those size systems in the high frequency as the choice for the optimization of the system response as opposed to on-site tuning. We can even see this happen in the low frequency. So once again, same exact set of measurements. Um, and notice that we see a variation in the floor notch. So this is the reflection of the sound. Remember when you're listening, you hear the direct sound that comes to your ears, but you also hear what is the reflection from the surface. In this case, at a festival, it's the ground you're standing on. So there's actually a reflection from the ground that you can hear as a notch in the response. And that notch is changing based on those atmospheric conditions as well. It's quite a significant change. So I might take one measurement, it looks very different than another one. So once again, you need to be careful of the way the atmosphere is, is affecting that. So be careful in those scenarios where you see a lot of variation based on atmosphere conditions. Um, Francois, correct me if I'm wrong, but this problem is linear with frequency and with distance. So in other words, um, the problem is worse, generally yeah. speaking, twice as bad at twice the distance, and it's twice as significant a variation at twice the frequency. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. Exa exactly yeah. yeah. Right, and I think, uh, I don't know if I said it, but at 10K, the variation was uh, on average plus or minus 5 dB on the set of measurements. So it's a pretty significant amount of variation. Yeah, and it's uh, with a very gentle condition again, so. Yeah, exactly, exactly. That wasn't even windy out yet. So uh, once again, if uh, we were talking to uh, Sergey, um, he might see a bit more variation because uh, I think the wind is always blowing at every festival in, in London as well. So it's raining and windy. Um, so it's uh, quite a challenging environment. Okay, second thing. Um, uh, when you're on site, you take a measurement of our system. We want to see what it's doing. Um, a measurement is, is a great way to understand the system behavior at a given point in space. The problem is, especially with a line source array, there's a lot of complex interactions of the array itself that are hard to understand, conceptualize in the measurement itself. Right. So I can often think I'm going to put a mic in the front, maybe a mic in the back, I'm really lucky I'll have a mic in the middle and I, and I realize that I want to change the response of the system in the front or the back. Now, the first thing is I might think that the one or two enclosures pointed at me at the very back are the one or two that are going to affect the response for me. And that's not actually true. What you're hearing is a subset of the entire array as a whole. So I'm actually listening to not just one enclosure that's pointed at me, but I'm actually listening to more and more enclosures as we go lower and lower in frequency. So at very high frequencies, it might only be one, two or three enclosures that you're listening to, but at slightly lower frequencies, it might be four, five, or six. So it's really difficult from a measurement perspective to understand what I should equalize, what portion of the array, and how that's going to affect this. Um, we're all quite familiar with this. If you've ever stood at the back of a venue and someone's muted the top, say, 2K1 or K2, the entire system doesn't go away. Right? You lose some detail on the high end, but you still have a fair bit of information, which tells you what you're listening to is not just those two boxes pointed at you, but more and more of the array as you go lower and lower in frequency. So the second thing is, of course, uh, this is all dependent on the geometry of the array, and this gets hard to conceptualize in a measurement, right? So if I think about this and I make an EQ choice on the top and I boost the high frequency a little bit, for instance, and I turn down the high frequency at the bottom a little bit to try to compensate for the proximity, um, the person in the middle is hearing a combination of the two. Did you think about that or have a measurement active at that time to see that behavioral change? And if you did it at these three positions, the question is what happens at the 900 other positions in the middle? And this is really where modelization comes into account, right? Um, if you guys want to learn more about this specific topic, this is actually a, an extract from a presentation that Francois did last week, Friday. I think that's correct. Um, uh, and it's on YouTube right now. I put the link on the screen here. Um, you can also go to our YouTube channel, which is uh, user LA, the best sound, um, and take a, a look at that presentation. It's uh, one of my favorite presentations we've ever done at L Acoustics, and it's a really intuitive way to understand how line source array physics works. So... Okay, uh, what we can't do is measure on site and get some representative data at distance because from moment in time to moment in time, we get a different behavior. And what we can't do is measure on site and understand what we need to affect in terms of equalization 
because we need to understand the geometry of the array and all the other positions that we might be affecting. So the best way to do this in terms of high frequency, especially, is to use sound vision and auto filter. Right? And this is a sound vision is our 3D modeling software where we can import the physical array parameters like the array position, its geometry of angles. We can think about the output resources so we don't overtax one amplifier versus another. And we can also think about all of the different positions within the array that it's covering, including some non-observed zones, right? So we can have hundreds of microphones, if you will, within the simulation versus two, three, or four that we might have on site. So let's go ahead and just take a look in sound vision real quick. And I'm gonna pop over to that. And just a refresh for everyone, if you've uh, not used this a whole lot before. So this is sound vision. This is our 3D modeling software um, that we use here at L Acoustics. Um, and this is for building venues that are very complex, like stadiums or arenas or theaters, or very simple things. This is a very simple thing. It's just a, what we call a profile. It's a very simple 2D shape that has been extruded into the third dimension. And I, I'm doing that just so we can demonstrate the behavior of this line source array. And this array happens to be some K1 and K2. And what I've already done um, for you guys, if you've been to some of the other webinars, is I've already optimized and auto splay the coverage. So we're actually covering here. Let's bring that open. Great. We're covering from the front row to the last row. This is about 85 meters away. Our reference position is 35 meters. And down front, we're covering at 5 meters. And we've set the SPL target to be plus 2 dB in front. So that means from 35 meters forward, we are allowing the system to gain 2 dB. And to the back, we're allowing it to go down 5 dB. So it's allowed to be 5 dB down in the very back, which seems appropriate. Um, within autosplay, we've done the mechanical optimization. So this is defining the best mechanical solution um, for this particular coverage scenario. And what's neat about that in the high frequency here, the 1 to 10K, um, our mechanical optimization has done a really good job of being really close to our target. So our target is this solid black line, and we've set some boundaries of plus or minus 1 dB. And right now we've gotten about 90 eight 99% within our target. The goal of auto filter is to uh, normalize the high frequency response in terms of flatness. So its goal is to uh, really try to make the most consistent or uh, uh, equal response in uh, the frequency response, but not necessarily the amplitude across the audience. And so what we can do within our demo here is use auto filter to do our tuning, if you will. So to do this, there's a couple things I want to consider, right? Um, I want to consider my, my configuration of my system. So in this case, my configuration is the LA-12X Amplify controller, and I have two enclosures per circuit. So in this case, I have six LA-12X to power this array of 8K1 and 4K2. And so, all right. And then what I can also do is set my atmospheric conditions. And here, my atmospheric conditions are set to be 20 degrees Celsius, and 60% humidity. So I want to think about my expected conditions on show site um, and, and, and maybe have an idea of where we're going to be. And with those parameters, SoundVision will now calculate the frequency response for each, pardon me, the electronic optimization for each amplifier to achieve the most consistent frequency response in the high frequency across the venue. So I'm going to click on this auto filter button. It takes one or two seconds. Cool. And so what it's actually done here is applied a differential EQ, taking into account where each loudspeaker is pointed and how each one is going to affect the adjacent areas and trying to do that all by keeping a certain amount of resources available. So it's actually only using up, in this case, 2.3 dB of headroom in our high frequency. Um, and what we can actually see here is the response that we have on each individual amplifier circuit. And so with an auto filter, you can see the response that's being done within the simulation environment. And these settings can actually be copied directly into LA Network Manager um, just by opening up the SoundVision file itself. So all of this is copied back into LA Network Manager just by opening that SoundVision file. So this scenario is doing what we can't do on site, right? It's actually giving us, in this case, a measurement every 20 centimeters. Um, and it's spatially averaging those. Oops, let's put that over there. It's spatially averaging those well over the course of a meter. So it's taking five of them and averaging them together. So this is a measurement every 20 centimeters here. That's something that's pretty hard to do on site. In this case, if I do my math from uh, uh, five to 85 meters, uh, we would see need something on the order of 400 different measurement points to be able to come up with that same simulation environment. Um, we're also able to take into account what each electronic circuit is doing at each of those points as well. And that's 
actually impossible to do. And the reason I say that is if you were to take a measurement of just one amplifier on site and then try to take a measurement of another one, time has changed, which means the atmosphere has changed. So the way they're combined is going to change as well. So all this can be done in simulation and imparted into LA Network Manager for operation of the show. Voila. Francois, should we talk a little bit about uh, what can affect your measurement in the low frequency and mid frequency? Mm, yes, exactly, because um, yeah, the, H, the HF uh, basically to, to be deal with uh, in the simulation, but uh, in, in the low mid and in, in the low, we, we need to, to, to take into account the room acoustics. All right, so these are a little harder to simulate for a million reasons, correct? But um, they're fairly easy to measure for several reasons. And the first thing we want to think about is the different types of irregularities. So um, let's just talk about uh, the types of reflections that we can experience and how they affect different frequency response. Um, so uh, this is a graph on the top of a comb filter, and what we're most concerned about are those first and uh, first notch of the comb filter is really our, our big problem child, um, both because it's quite severe and it's also generally quite wide in terms of its frequency response. It can be caused by a couple of different things, right? Um, uh, I should say it's always caused by the same thing, which is a reflection, um, but there's a couple of primary contributors. Uh, and we can experience a reflection or a first order reflection that causes a problem from uh, a boundary close to a source. So I like to think of this, the most obvious one is uh, a subwoofer next to a wall. If it's a, just the right distance away from the wall, it's gonna cause a problem in the response for a huge portion of the audience. We can also get variable problems, and this is not a boundary close to a speaker, but it's a boundary maybe close to you, the listener, or far away from the speaker. And this would be the sidewall, the floor, the ceiling. Um, and these are a problem specifically because they're not consistent, right? It's not a problem always at one frequency like that, that, that surface next to a speaker, but it's a problem that varies with space. So in a bigger venue, you can have a massive amount of variance with these first order reflections across the venue. This bottom graph is a simulation of a fairly large venue and it's a simulation of a measurement every square meter. And the problem you see is that at one position we might have a huge problem at say 200 hertz and at a slightly different position it's now at 300, it's now at 400, it's now at 500. So how do you make an EQ choice that necessarily represents that complex problem? Well what you need to be able to do is discover where these problems are. Right? And you need to be able to discover which ones are stable problems and which ones are not stable problems. And the only way to do this is have enough data. Right? So you need to have enough data to ensure that you're making a choice that's both rational for the particular environment it's in. Um, and uh, as you start to see more and more data come in, you can start to decide where you can do, say, soft EQ. I don't want to attack a specific problem, say, in this set of measurements between 150 and 400 hertz because we can see there's a massive amount of variation. So the choice of fixing this problem at one frequency is going to be very different than fixing it at another. But we can start to think about other places where there's consistency amongst many or most measurements. If every single one of the measurements has a similar problem at say five or 600 hertz, um, we might decide that addressing that is something reasonable to do for a sharper EQ than just a overall, there's maybe a little too much information from 200 to 1k, but specifically at what is this 510 or 520 hertz, almost every measurement has a buildup. That, that indicates to me there might be a specific problem. Scott, Scott, please. Yes, sir. Um, I don't have a, a, a dozens of, of microphones. I, I need to choose for a few locations. So how can I be sure that uh, with uh, only a few locations, I'm going to, to pick up the right uh, set of measurement that uh, is going to be representative of the actual behavior of the room. Uh, Francois, that's uh, the best setup we've had all week. Thank you for that. Um, so the question is, how many do we need, right, Francois? Um, and uh, I'm lucky. I've got a really nice system tuning kit. I carry around with me four microphones. Um, uh, Francois, you you have uh, you have twelve microphones in your office as well, right? Two. Two. Okay, two. Yeah. So. Uh, the question is, how many different locations do you have to measure in order to start to determine what is a stable versus a variable irregularity? So in other words, how many measurements do I need to figure out what is this problem specifically at one frequency versus this huge amount of variability in the low? Um, and so 
what we've actually done is some research. We're going to go into this a huge bit more detail if you want to learn more about this process and where this data comes from on Friday. Um, but specifically, if you take one measurement, what's your risk of that one being representative and you making a good or bad EQ choice? And it turns out if you take one or two measurement locations, you're really highly risked to take a bad EQ choice. Um, if you start taking more measurements, it starts getting better and better. But the good news is, Francois, that there's a limit, if you will, to this. In other words, when I go beyond eight measurements, it doesn't get a whole lot better. I don't get much return for my investment, right? So um, that's a really important aspect when I think about how much work we have to do at a calibration is, do I need to take 20 different locations or can I do uh, a reasonable number that are distributed in the right way? And that's what we're talking about here. So beyond eight locations, it doesn't get a whole lot better. The risk factor is not improved much. So you still could make a bad choice. Um, I hate to tell you that, Francois, but if you if you take uh, eight locations, you have a good chance, eight properly distributed locations, let's say, you have a good chance of getting the representative information to find the best choices for EQ. Yeah, and I like this number, the number eight. Uh, I think there is a good rule of thumb that maybe we can mention is like maybe uh, uh, you can go for one EQ point uh, per number of locations. So if you only measure at one location, what you can only do is maybe one LF contour adjustment globally. Sure. Uh, and more you have point, maybe more you you you, you can uh, add add EQ points. And uh, yeah, eight location it it makes a uh, eight EQ points. So that that's okay. We have uh, eight PAQ in a in LA network manager, and uh, I think that's enough. And uh, and we should should not go uh, much more than that. Yeah, I always feel if you do more than 80 cues, there's probably something wrong with your design to begin with, right? Um, you probably need to think about the the original functional design from Sound Vision if you have to have that many different cues. So I guess the question is, obviously, we need eight. Um, how do we think about where we should measure? And and the scenario here is we want to avoid the areas with the largest variability, right? Um, if we put a microphone in the worst spot and we thought of that as representative of the largest amount of area, we would probably get bad results. So generally speaking, there are certain areas that are uh, poor choices that don't represent the audience as a whole. Um, the first area is adjacent to sidewalls in an indoor venue. When you're too close to the wall, that reflection is, is quite stable, if I recall. And that stable reflection will mean you tend to make poor choices that don't represent most of the audience. Right, so let's avoid being too close to the sidewall. So I think the rule of thumb, uh, Francois, is three meters, correct? That's a good, good rule of thumb. Yeah, it's it's about cl closest you are you are to the wall. Um, more local is uh, is uh, the irregularity in terms of frequency. So there is a, a huge huge change in frequency uh, closer you are to 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 one of the of the room uh, boundary. Yeah, exactly. And same thing, front wall. Let's avoid the front wall. We get reflections from that based on on the specific conditions. This is also a, a bit more amplified of a problem on a very large line source array. Right down front, the, the frequency response is the most divergent from the rest of the audience. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. Uh, when you are close to the to, to line source and uh, it's the case we we mainly with uh, with large arrays uh, trying to, to cover a lot you have this kind of uh, uh, sometimes a bit of uh, low mid uh, notch there and there that uh, if you measure it some people that think that that's a floor notch when, but that's not that's to be uh, I would say addressed through through design and not through EQ again so if you have this data into your measurement actually it's going to pollute uh, the interpretation of your data. You know, and of course, if we don't want to be near a sidewall, we probably don't want to be near the rear wall. We get a pretty good solid echo off of that, especially mm -hmm. in uh, every music club I've ever been to in my entire life. Um, it's always where, of course, you mix a theater show from is uh, 1.5 meters off the back wall. So you're telling me that's not very representative of the rest of the audience, correct? Yeah, <clears throat> yeah exactly. All is about uh, actually it's uh, it's because you only have few locations so uh, for sure if you if you could map the whole audience area and put a microphone every 20 centimeter then it would be, be best to measure everywhere because at the end as the average is going to be the most representative but as soon as you have only few location you ad you end up maybe putting one or two mics in this kind of uh, i would say really what we call outliers in statistics, and this is going to corrupt the data and corrupt your, your, your interpretation again. So Francois, I think this is where I get to say my favorite analogy in the entire world, which I believe you uh, absolutely enjoy the most of, which is 
uh, calibrating a sound system, taking some measurements is just like doing a political poll. In a perfect world, we would actually vote and we would go measure every single person in the audience and we would know exactly how it's working. The problem is we neither have the time or that number of microphones to do that. So the second best thing is to get a good representation of the audience as a whole. And what we want to avoid is putting all of our microphones in one extreme party or the other, therefore really skewing the, the concept of what it is. And we see that in the newspaper when we read about a politician. Uh, some good polling information will take that into account and try to weight all of these differentially. They'll also try to sample what is the most representative of the country as a whole that's voting. I like this analogy. Yeah. Cool. So our measurement area should be last and not least uh, where the speaker system is covering, right? Uh, it doesn't do a whole lot of good to try to equalize the system and measure it from behind or beside if we're trying to optimize the coverage of the speaker system itself. So this is our measurement area. It's in the coverage of our speaker system. It's going to be away from the side walls and rear walls so we don't skew our data because we only have eight measurements to place. And then I guess the next question is where should we place our microphones? And um, this is the cool thing where we all get to pretend like we're going to the zoo today, right? <laughs> so um, unfortunately, we're not allowed to go to the zoo here in California. I think the same thing in Paris and Berlin. But if you look at these mic placements, I believe you call this the zebra or is it the cheetah? Um, kind of depends on, on what you're... Uh, that, okay, it's the hippo layout. There you go. You um, yeah, no worries. No worries. Um, so this is the... <laughs> The zebra arrangement, right? So what we want to do is avoid too much regularity because often what I used to do years ago as well, I think many of us was have a perfect grid, which meant we had a perfect equidistant from that sidewall. And of course we ended up close to it sometimes, which which amplified the, the conditions of that sidewall. And we want to vary the depth too. We ended up having all these mics at an equidistant interval and then gridded across the venue, which meant we had regular distances from the PA and those regular distances amplified the floor information or the floor reflection. So let's randomize both our depth from the array, that's the, in this case, this up and down axis, and our width from the array, that's our left to right axis. So if you notice, none of these are exactly the same, and we create this pretty simple little pattern, right? And uh, my favorite thing is kind of to, to concept this on advance before I get to the show, uh, to the calibration and, and chart out my goals, but I don't necessarily write the chair number I want to hit. Um, I just get a concept of I want it to be in this area. And that's what I want to do in advance. So this is really where when you start thinking about all this, how M1 really starts making a lot more sense and why we've gone the route to develop M1 the way we have. Um, we need to get a bigger set of measurements, but I think it's a lot to ask people to both have a lot of microphones and a lot of cables. Um, so we need a way to measure these systems and process the data in a different way. And this is what M1 is all about. So let's go ahead and take a look at M1. So I flipped over here to LA Network Manager. Uh, this is 3.1, which will be coming out soon. Um, Network Manager 3.1 is, is quite nice. It incorporates a couple of new things. Um, for those of you who were on yesterday's webinar, you got a sneak peek at it, but uh, one of the big advances is the P1 now has eight DSP buses. Uh, so the next update you guys get will give you that as well. Um, it's really exciting. The other thing we can do is actually measure a P1 bus itself. So we can use a P1 as one of the measurement points within our M1 workspace. Uh, if you've never seen Network Manager before, let me give you the 30 second overview of this. Um, there are four types of objects on this workspace. <coughs> Pardon me. There are four types of objects on this workspace. Um, the first one is an Amplify controller. That's this little guy right here. And this happens to be an LA-12X. It's that LA-12X that's sitting right behind me over here. Hold on, let's see. It's that one right there. Okay, uh, the camera's not on me. Never mind. Um, that LA-12X is IP address 192.168.1.101. And you'll see the 101 always stays there. Just kind of let you know which one it is. This is the P1. This is the processor, the AVB processor that uh, does the DSP buses. It also has 20 inputs. So it's got four mic pre's on it, four line in, four AES inputs and eight AVB inputs. And it has 16 outputs. That's eight AVB outputs, four AES and four analog outputs on it. Um, these guys right here, so this X8 or this P1 bus, these are groups. And a group is something we use to control the parameters of either a P1 or an amplified controller. And the things we can control are gain, delay, polarity, mute, uh, solo, uh, equalization. 
And so we use that for anything we want to maybe EQ differently or gain differently or delay differently, mute differently, solo differently. We also use it now for anything we wish to measure. So in this case, um, we could measure the group X8, and that's where we use these green guys, which are the measurement location. So a measurement location is just a location I'm going to take a measurement of my sound system. In this case, I've laid out my zebra here to match my particular layout, and I've just named, numbered them one through eight. I might be uh, want to know exactly where one of them is, so I could change number five to be FOH, so I know that that happens to be front of house, for example. And all I have to do to attach these is simply uh, drag and touch. So if I were to deselect these guys, I can click on it and add one at a time. That's one way to do it. Or this is a trick for you guys if you've never seen this. If you click and hold the mouse down, I can touch these. And when I do that, it'll add everything I touch. So real quickly, I can set up my calibration. So this is me doing the work before I get there. Before we've turned the system on, we can actually have this all done in advance before we arrive. And it's great because we've given ourselves a goal. The goal of my system is to measure eight different positions, in this case of a 5XT, X8, and Siva sub that's sitting behind me. So uh, we've also needed to configure our presets. I've done that already. And we need to say patch our network. So uh, in this case, I might choose the input mode of this amplifier. And in this case, it's connected to the P1 that's behind me on this AVB network. I'm using an LS10 uh, Avenue certified AVB switch to connect all these devices as well. Step two, go on to the tuning page. So within the tuning page, um, we have a couple of different things. We can now see the mute status of everything. Um, we can see the input level if there was any signal. In this case, I can see the microphones that I've got in this room on the P1 meter responding. Um, we could see the polarity status of everything. We could toggle the polarity if we wanted to. All of that's possible. But the neat thing in Network Manager 3.0 and above, in this case 3.1, we have M1. And if we launch M1, it takes us to the first of a three-step process, the first being the record page. So I want to be able to quickly and easily get a lot of data, and this is what M1 is all about. Right? M1 takes care of all of the uh, uh, menial tasks, like, say, muting and unmuting speakers. It takes care of measuring the system, uh, labeling that information, storing that information, indexing that information. Um, and so this allows you to take just a couple of calibration mics. In case, this case, Francois has two. Um, in order to uh, represent him today, I only set up two of my four mics. Um, I can actually pre-choose even in advance which mic preamp is going to be used for each location. So let's go ahead and set up our little zebra here today. And we will really quickly um, move those mics into position. And I just hit start record. Great. And so M1 took care of the muting, the unmuting. It's actually uh, toggled through all the different groups that have that. And this works whether you have a simple sound system like I do here today or a very complex one uh, that has multiple arrays um, in multiple locations. All of that can be can be automated within M1, which is great. Um, for each measurement, we get a couple of data uh, points here to take a look at. This first thing is this dotted line is the signal to noise ratio. I'm in a really well-treated room, so I have a really good signal noise ratio. Uh, and this is the S and R, or signal noise ratio in dB. And what we want to find is a value greater than 20 dB is our goal. If it's greater than 20 dB, the quality indicator in the bottom is green. So in this case, this is my actual measurement, and I can see it in magnitude over here. And this is the SNR, and we can see that it's greater than 20B for the operating range of the 5XT. That's great. Same thing on that one. So we can approve the two of those. The sub, its operating range is from 27 to 100 hertz. Looks pretty good. SNR looks great. Once again, not surprised. I'm in a really well-treated room. This is my X8, and that's my X8. It operates down to just about 60 hertz. And look at that. We're good SNR all the way down to its operating bandwidth. So we're, we're well off. So we can really quickly take a number of data points. In fact, I will really quick arm the next two and just move this slightly in the world's smallest calibration. If anyone has seen NPR Tiny Desk, this is NPR or uh, L Acoustics Tiny Calibration.
Great, and just checking that data one more time. It's all looking really good. I don't see anything scary yet. So I'm gonna approve all of those. And let's move on to the Q tab real quick. So we talked about earlier, uh, how many measurements do we need? Um, if Francois and I only took a look at one measurement and we saw this response, we might decide that there's a problem here at, I don't know, 550 Hertz. So this could be a problem. We've just decided that this today is not good. Um, and with one measurement, that, that, that could be a dangerous choice to make. So if I go ahead and put this measurement in and take a look at 577, 527s there would help. And let's take that down by three or four dB. Let's do a tight Q. That looks like a specific problem. Let's put it at a really tight Q here. And I can actually see the impact of that measurement. Great. Oh, it would help if I put it on the right speaker. So up on top here, you actually have the choice of which group you're affecting. Um, and what's neat about M1 is you can change the response of anything after you've taken the measurement. So I took the measurement. I decided I didn't like this problem on this one measurement and I've applied an EQ and I can actually see it's EQ change. So what M1 is actually doing was with each measurement it takes, it also stores the entire metadata of the system. And that metadata then allows you to modify any parameter along the way. So we've taken this choice, but we realized, oops, we need to take more measurements and we can take a new measurement with a different EQ in place. Remember, we've modified the EQ since we took the original set of measurements. And now this EQ is, or this measurement was actually taken with that EQ in place, which is okay. Um, M1 is ability to turn on or off any EQ as you go. And so we can, once again, go back to our EQ page and make a new modification and decide on that last measurement. There turns out there was a problem here at 362. Let's solve that real quick and see if this is a good choice to make. I'm gonna guess it's not, but that's okay. Sure, that's what we're gonna do. And let's go back to record and arm the last two. Cool. All right, so what's neat about this, if you guys remember, if you were doing your tuning chart at home, on these first four, we had no EQ. On the next two, we had some EQ, and on the last two, we had a lot of EQ. Um, M1 is a tuning software within the control environment. So it's aware of every one of the changes we made at each individual time. In fact, it can turn on and off any of these EQs at any time and show the difference in response across all the different measurements. So this allows you now to start getting a lot of data and to start working through your tuning process. So that meant what Francois said is we could take a look at the low end after our first measurement and decide there's not gonna be enough low end, right Francois? We might wanna add that, that low end after the first measurement. And, and actually we can see on all of them that that's fairly consistent. So I think that supports your idea here that the low end is, is pretty stable. I'm trying to turn these on. Oh, I'm clicking too fast. That's why, there we go. So we can see, hey, the low end is pretty consistent across all the different measurements. That's okay to, to affect that even with just one or two measurements. But as we start to get more and more measurements, we start to see that there's a lot of variation happening in our tiny tuning. Um, but maybe there's a bit of a stable scenario right here. And the easy way to see that might be to show the average. So here's the average and I might wanna smooth it at a third. And here's the whole set. And boy, there's a stable area. Is it a problem? No, it doesn't look like a problem to me, so we can leave that. But my EQ choices I made after one or two measurements might not have been great ideas um, because maybe it wasn't the most consistent in that area. So this is really powerful that you can go through and do this um, throughout the process, right? You can, you can change and modify your EQ and it doesn't affect the data you've collected because of the power of M1. And that's a really important aspect and that allows us to scale up to having all of these different measurement locations. 
Cool. So thank, thank you, Scott. I think we uh, we got quite a, a few questions about main sub alignment in a, in the Q and A. So obviously we it's it's more than forty minutes long to 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 cover just to to find the right location. But maybe you can uh, talk a bit sure. about it. Sure, absolutely. Let's go main sub alignment, right? So um, let's just real quickly talk about the different configurations. We have coupled configurations, and that would be scenarios where the main and the sub are adjacent to each other. This is my favorite and preferred scenario. I think yours as well, Francois. Um, mm -hmm. It's the easiest to align. Um, it means you have really good consistency across the venue. Um, the second best choice is, of course, mains and subs separated vertically. This is a flown PA with a ground stack sub. This would be pretty common in a theater or uh, maybe even a uh, a small or medium-sized club. A lot of people like having a single mono subwoofer. Um, that's the best for your subwoofer consistency across the venue. If it only comes from one place, it's going to be very consistent everywhere. And then, of course, you have uh, uh, the other one, which is the mains and subs maybe on the ground. Uh, in the center, this would be uh, my mains plus my sub arc. Right? Those are the, the four general con concepts of mains and subs. What's really nice if you have your mains and your subs at the same location. So if we have the mains and the subs at the same location, we can uh, optimize the response just using the manufacturer optimized presets and our pre alignment delay values. So what does that mean? Um, each preset we build at L Acoustics, we try to impart the minimal amount of latency. So we're not setting up each preset so that everything works with everything else out of the box. You might have to apply a bit of delay and or polarity shift for say, a K1 to work with uh, uh, K1SB or K1 to work with KS28. The nice thing is we actually give you a preset guide. It's on our website. Uh, it comes with LA Network Manager download as well. And this gives you the chart, hey, if I have a K1 and a K1SB and they're side by side, what should I do in terms of alignment? Well, you should do this. This is the combination you should do. Um, we have, generally speaking, most or all uh, standard configurations that match with our guides and our manuals, and we have a few more than that as well in that guide. So it's a great reference point to get started. Um, and usually when you measure this on site, it's what, plus or minus a millisecond from that value? So that doesn't always work when you have separated systems. Let's talk about uh, flown mains and ground stack subwoofer. That's the first one, that vertically separated system. And the reason this doesn't work in that scenario is we have to choose a spot for alignment. Right, the, the difference in time arrival when you're in front is different than the difference in time arrival in back. And we need to find uh, the amount of geometric delay added for the separation of those sources. But of course we have to choose one spot that's gonna be best. And so the question is, is there one spot that's gonna be best that also works for most people? Let's think a bit about the spatial compromise, especially in the subwoofer in terms of the time window we have available. So let's take a main system and a subwoofer system. So the main in the sub, uh, in this case, let's talk about the maximum frequency of overlap somewhere around 100 Hertz or the one of concern of 100 Hertz. Um, let's also think about something which is the relative difference in energy between the two. So this graph here, I like this graph a lot. It shows the level in summation between two speakers. In this case, the black line is say two speakers that have the same amount of energy. And if they're perfectly in phase, we get plus six dB. So a main and a sub at 100 Hertz, exactly the same amplitude. If the main and the sub are the same amplitude and they arrive zero degree phase offset, we get plus six dB in energy. However, if they arrive 180 degrees apart from each other, then we get uh, negative infinity. Do you know where that energy goes, Francois? Does it disappear into nothing? Um, or is it uh, just turn into heat, I think, is where it goes, doesn't it? So that all that all disappears into nothing. However, if you have, say, a 6 dB difference in level, so my main and my sub are 6 dB different in level, we get about plus 3.5 if we're zero degree phase offset. Um, but then again, if we're 180 degree phase offset, we only lose 6 dB, so it's not as tragic. Okay, so now our concern is going to be how big of a time window or a phase window do we have? Well, it turns out if we go plus or minus 90 degrees of phase response, um, we don't have any loss of energy in summation all the way down to a pretty low level in dB difference, right? So even all the way down to 12 dB separated. So that's great. Yeah, um, so actually, at a actually, that 
that's why we um, in this graph we we, we choose to have this uh, 100 hertz because this is not not necessarily the crossover point but the upper the upper overlap uh, frequency between the sub and the main meaning that even if we have a, a crossover point at uh, 60 hertz for example at one, 100 hertz we still have uh, I would say combination of the element, even if there are maybe 10 of or, or 12, 12 dB uh, uh, different in terms of level, uh, you need to, to consider that uh, that you can have a, a more or less good summation even with a, with a differential. So we, we consider, the, I would say, the, the most critical frequency in the overlap, which is the upper frequency. Right, so it's, it, this problem only gets easier as we go down in frequency, right? So exactly. at 50 hertz, we get twice the amount of time as we do at, at 100 hertz, but of course at, at 100 hertz, um, even with like say a KS28 versus a K1, we're still within probably 10 or 12 dB of the two operating. Um, so that is definitely the concern. So plus or minus 2.5 milliseconds, in other words, a five millisecond window. And the great news is that that gives you a fair amount of movement. And so let's think about that main system where the main was flown and the subs are on the ground. Where in the room is a good place to choose time alignment? What's gonna be representative? Um, where do you see the most variation in the arrival between the two? With the system low, so say a club, um, pretty much anywhere you can put the microphone is gonna be within a couple milliseconds uh, of variance across the venue. This is really consistent. Even as the system gets larger, so this is 80 meters back, this would be maybe a large theater arena or a, uh, a, a festival. Um, other than the first quarter of the venue, everybody else is very consistent in time alignment. So as long as we don't choose our time alignment point of our main and our sub right in the very front, everything should be okay. So what about the hardest of all to align? This would be the flown left right main with the center ground stack subwoofer. Um, this is really challenging because we have two different distances varying, right? So if we think about this, I have both a depth variance as I, I go front to back. So in other words, the two of them are arriving at different times as I change my depth and horizontally I see a variance as well. And so the window or space where you have a good alignment potential is really quite small. Um, and we actually know this, we're really used to this, right? Um, this is why it's hard to get a time alignment when you have a left right sound system and a center sub. And so if the system is is fairly small, it's it's not terrible. Um, in fact, everywhere that's dark blue is 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 really good for us. The lighter blue is okay. Beyond that, we're in trouble. Um, the system that's a bit higher, so this is once again a main system flown at six meters, subs on the ground. There's a really tiny window where we can get a good consistent alignment. Everywhere else is going to be hugely off in time. And this problem will actually shift. So that, that vector of goodness will shift as you shift the time alignment. So just adjacent to everywhere you are will be a problem. The best compromise in this sense to find the most people within a good time window and hopefully to keep front of house in a good time window is generally halfway between the main and your ground sex sub. So if you were to think about the the width position, let's go halfway between those two, generally in the middle of the venue, that's about the best choice you can make. Francois, what about mains and fills? Uh, can we take the same approach with mains and fills? Um, not exactly, actually. It's a bit different, but we can start with, this, with I would say, with, uh, with, with the same analysis, but it's much more challenging in terms of time window. Right, so I know in your full training seminar, you guys actually do some really great demonstrations of how to hear this and, and where we can do different time scenarios depending on the fill. Um, and unfortunately, that doesn't work really well in a set of headphones on a webinar. Um, so I invite you guys to definitely, uh, uh, when we're, we're all allowed to get together again, uh, to come to one of those trainings and experience that and go more deep into these topics. Um, but for now, the real problem is that the frequency range is much higher of overlap. So if we even take the lowest frequency, which is the easiest one, let's say one kilohertz, we get a time window of what, half a millisecond is our, our threshold or our range. Um, so if we move the mic 15 centimeters to the left or the right, we're out of our window. Is that what, what the scenario is? So how yeah. do we do this? Um, when you start talking about alignment of fills, you're doing it with a spatial compromise. You're trying to find the solution that'll best fit the design as a whole, best fit the venue as a whole. And this is really ultimately a design problem. If you put a delay in the wrong spot and try to use it, you're not going to be able to find a better compromise on site, right? Um, if you have a front fill in a challenging spot, um, you're not going to be able to find a better solution on site. So ultimately, we need to think about doing this from a design perspective and using something like Sound Vision to model that. So that initial design we did in Sound Vision, I've actually included a slightly larger venue, and I've also included 
uh, a few more arrays. And if you've not done this before, SoundVision has a couple of operating modes. Often we're just looking at the SPL or the energy on the audience. So we can think about that as how loud it is at what frequency, but we also have the ability to look at what we call delay mode. And what delay mode does is takes each one of these impact dots. So each one of these represents a coverage point within the venue, but at each of those, it calculates the arrival time from every active source and applies a set of filters. So the set of filters are based on a time and SPL window, and you guys can actually set these time and SPL window. In this case, I've set it to be 3 dB and 5 milliseconds, right? So my goal is to find the space where the two things arrive at a similar time. In this case, it happens to be these red dots right now, and at a similar SPL. Okay, so 3 dB, 5 milliseconds. If it's blue right now, what that says is I only hear one speaker within my SPL window. So in this case, if I click on one of these blue dots, it says to me that the main arrives at 100 dB, the fill that's turned on arrives at 88. It's 12 dB down. I probably don't need to be as concerned about that one in this case. Um, however, over here in red, if I click on that, what I see, if I click on that in red, is the fill arrives at 97 dB and the main arrives at 97 dB. So they're both the same level, and yet there's a 13 millisecond difference in time. So the main is arriving a little bit later by 13 milliseconds, so I need to apply some delay to my fill in order to time align these. The way I like to think of this, Francois, well, I don't know if you're the same, is each one of these little dots represents a, a microphone. So if we went and did this calibration, we would actually have put out, say, 500 different microphones, and we could shift the delay and see how it affects 500 microphones at one time. So let's go ahead and put five millisecond on our delay group. And what we start to see is some things are turning yellow, and yellow means I'm hearing the two speakers at a similar SPL in within my given time window. So let's say my goal now is to get as many of these as yellow as possible. And as I start adding time, we start to see whether or not I can do that. Let's go 11, let's go 12. And what's neat about this is we actually see this starting to shift and we can find where we might want. Oh, we're getting a little too far, aren't we? There we go, let's keep going. So now we've gone too far. So we've shifted our delay over. And this is a really great starting point. So this is actually how we do delays for big festivals. Um, this is how we do delays for corporate events or special events is we start with this value. We can import that into Network Manager. We can then measure that on site and we can verify that that's correct. And from here, we can also perceive a difference, right? I might choose to have one arrive slightly ahead of the other because I'm gonna localize to what arrives first. So I might choose that I want the main to arrive just a millisecond or two early for most of these people and let that really be the indicator for localization. Yeah, I think there's the approach of uh, doing the fill alignment in design combined with uh, uh, on-site critical listening is pro probably the, the best combo. Yeah, you know, you know, for a lot of the big festivals that I've worked on over the years, um, ironically, 99% of the delay towers are done in SoundVision. Um, yeah. We've actually stopped even measuring, for instance, the delay showers out at some of the biggest festivals uh, for time because it's really hard to get a good time signal at you know 150 meters away, first off. Um, and secondly, it's much more about perception at that point. The sound vision time gets us plus or minus three or four milliseconds uh, based on where the exact tower position was um, and a million other parameters. And now it's just uh, take a millisecond on or off to, to get that image to go where you want it to go. So I totally agree with that. So, Francois, what's our priority? Where do we start with? Um, I've got no time. Show's about to start. Um, I guess main sub alignment. That's it, right? Just check your main sub alignment. Um, probably at what mix position? I unfortunately or fortunately, however you want to consider it. Yeah. Um, so that's the only thing we can do. So if you have very limited time, um, I, I would I would hesitate to do any EQ based on measurement. I might take a listen to my ears and decide there's too much mid range. Um, as I walk around the venue, because my ears can spatially average really quick in what, 30 or 40 seconds. Um, if we got a bit more time, what's the next priority? The, the most covered system, which is usually the mains, right? So uh, optimizing the response of the main system for the local variables. Yeah, I remember this is what uh, established our reference response. So this is really the, the I would say the, the main target to address. Yep, yeah, exactly. And so that means that all eight of those positions, I've set a priority to do the, the recording of the main and the sub. Remember, we can pre-program this before we got our, our tuning slot, so it's really quick and ready to go. And if you had four microphones, for instance, that would only be pressing the record button twice, so that's pretty quick to do. Um, if we have a little bit more time, I guess what's the next step, which is start to do alignment of our fill zones um, and verify that, right? So we can start to check to make sure that that matches our design and then 
go on to the last step, which is adding the spatial EQ for the fills as well, right? So measure multiple spots of a large fill zone, like an outfill or a delay system, right? So just a reminder, uh, the loudspeaker system calibration and workflows. Um, this starts with the project workflow, right? Which is all about design, implementation, calibration, and operation. Um, today, we specifically talked about the calibration, um, which really starts with that office preparation, right? Um, I'm getting my file ready. I'm setting my objectives for my calibration. I'm defining all my measurement locations. All of that can be done well before you show up on site, which is really cool. On-site verification, Francois, what do we mean by on-site verification? Is this a matter of making sure the speakers are plugged in correctly? Mm, different different things to check. First is a, is a validation of the design itself. Uh, is my design based on a accurate venue model? So you have to check a few room dimension to be sure that uh, you are in, in the in the right, uh, would say, uh, it's you are not at one or two meter, but uh, basically you need to 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 be sure that uh, uh, you have the right dimension for the room. Then you need to be sure that uh, you implemented the sources at the right location, the right entanglement angles, extra extra. Uh, and then there is a acoustic output check as well. So through measurement or or, or critical listening, you, you need you need to check a few things to be sure that all is uh, operational. Great, and then. Uh, on-site measurement, that's that acquisition of data process, right? So we want to start acquiring the data and then we can start thinking about the tuning of the data at that point, right? So um, the one thing to remember, uh, I said a few minutes ago, what if you have no time? Uh, I love about M1 is I have five minutes, we have to start sound check. I get the system aligned at front of house. Um, when the band takes a five minute break to use the bathroom, I can take my next set of measurements and move them around the venue. Um, and it doesn't matter that we've made any cue choice already. It all takes care of that. The last step is handover. This is where we start to talk to the people about how we want the system to sound, right? Um, because uh, they might have a different objective in terms of the content style they're doing, right? Um, and so um, when we start going through that tuning workflow of main plus sub plus equalization, main plus fill alignment, fill equalization, um, and we start to tune that or tone that for our specific use case, the music genre. Hey, this is a classical orchestral venue. This is a EDM nightclub. Um, there might be a different target that is achieved for, for all of those. So I think the last thing, this is one of my, uh, I believe, uh, what is the word on this? It's the greatest slide at L Acoustics ever history, Francois? Is that is that what you said? Yeah, I like this slide because uh, I designed it. <laughs> but uh, no, no, but uh, again, it's uh, it, it might be difficult uh, to get uh, all the, the, the essence uh, of it, but I think this presentation already uh, Kind of uh, address quite a lot of uh, uh, of the topics that that we cover in the training, and uh, this slide is um, is really about uh, this. I would say this balance between uh, what we should do on site, what we should do uh, uh, through the design and the simulation. So we know that uh, at the end, all is about a combination of the loudspeaker and a room sort of reflection, but still. We have some, I would say, clear tendency, uh, clear trends, I would say. More you go into the LF, more you need to take into account the, the room acoustics because it's going to be, uh, I would say, included uh, into, uh, I would say, it's going to be fused with direct sound, even perceptually. So this is something that we, we need to address. And by the way, that we, we are not really good at, at, simulate, at, at simulating. But for the HF, that's the other way around. More you go in the HF, more you need to rely on the direct sound. And the best way to address direct sound is through simulation. Again, you, you, we, we, we know that there are, there are lots of discussion about measurement, how you, how you can, um, I would say, um, uh, remove the reflection from the measurement uh, to have a clean HF response. But at the end, we are not really interested in, into that when you, because we, we like to deal with uh, most of the HF tuning uh, in simulation and all this little, I would say, comb filtering in the HF from the reflection, by the way, we cannot really uh, hear them. Uh, I would say we, uh, we have a binaural approach, so we, we most of the time the brain is clever enough to kind of uh, um, deconvoluate the room from the direct sound in the HF. So 
that this slide is talking about this. Uh, that's again a binary simplification. So HF is design EQ, LF is on site EQ. Um, all, all in all, there is a, a transition zone in between, but that's uh, the main idea be, behind this. And critical listening, uh, we should never forget about this. So it's not just all about the wiggly line on the screen. We need to take a listen to the system we're operating, the system we're tuning, the system we're calibrating, and ensure that the response is hitting the objectives we want, not just from a measurement, but also from, a, I guess, an emotional level as well. Um, Francois, this is uh, really cool. Um, uh, thank you guys very much for joining us today. This is a, a, a quite a, a, a short version of, of a bit of information that we have in a training seminar that is uh, being conducted uh, hopefully soon again around the world. Um, mm -hmm. If you guys have more information about or want more information about that, don't hesitate to come to that training seminar. Um, we are uh, starting uh, tomorrow with another case study of an application. This is a much larger venue. Um, uh, it, it involves uh, through the process from that uh, initial design through through the system verification uh, and tuning and calibration of the system. And on Friday, Etienne is presenting a presentation all about the the acquisition of good data, right, Francois? Yeah, so I think uh, um, he's going to dig into um, uh, some of the results we, 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 we published uh, uh, for the AS, Audio Engineering Society, about uh, measurement location, uh, but also other topics that we, we cover in, in white papers that are going to be published uh, quite soon and uh, I would say uh, freely available on uh, our website. So it's going to be a, a bit more scientific, but it's going to be kind of the background, uh, I would say supporting all of our recommendation in terms of uh, measurement and, uh, and tuning. Cool. Um, well, I, I, I don't know. Uh, I think the guys in the moderation pool seem to have done a really great job answering all the questions. Um, I know there were a few questions about uh, mic placement. Uh, Fran, uh, Etienne's going to do a really deep dive on that on Friday, so I think we'll probably pitch yeah. that to Friday. Um, and uh, and I think that's really great. Um, so thank you everyone for joining us today. Thank you, Francois. Thank you, Josh, Martin, Andre, as well. Um, you guys have uh, and Sergey. I don't want to forget about you, Sergey. Thank you, sir. Um, and Scott. Uh, thank really, you, Scott. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Francois. Um, thank you guys very much for joining us uh, all around the world. Uh, I really hope you're able to take the next couple of weeks to improve your skills, uh, to be healthy, be safe. Um, if you guys have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to us on social media. Um, our presentations are uh, live on YouTube, or pardon me, are uh, uh, replayed on YouTube as well shortly after this. Uh, so don't uh, don't hesitate to jump and watch those if you've missed it. Thank you guys very much. Have a great rest of your day. We will talk to you soon.